We're going to continue our journey with Luke, except with the other book that he wrote, which is the book of Acts. So it's, it's going to be neat because we can continue the story that we've been in. So we'll be in Luke or Acts chapter 1 today to continue the story after the resurrection happened and what happened next. Because the story, as we know, was not over. And if you remember, the, the first book that he would have written would have been his gospel. And so how he starts here in Acts chapter 1 makes sense. Because he says, in the first book, O Theophilus, which would have been the gospel that he wrote, in the first book, Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So let's stop right there for a minute. The resurrection, he's saying, Theophilus, the resurrection is not the end of the story. There's more. So Jesus had already accomplished what we needed for salvation, and he was saying, but people still needed to hear the story. People still needed to hear about Jesus and experience the kingdom of God like the 12 disciples had experienced what they had experienced with Jesus, and that that story needed to go out for the story to be complete. So Jesus didn't just immediately go back into heaven. He spent 40 days, it says, talking to his disciples about what he had been talking about for the past three years, the kingdom of God. And we'll get to that again in a moment, but it, it goes on. It says, while he stayed with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, as we journey through the story of the Acts of the Apostles, we will see that that story is all about the Holy Spirit working in and through his people to the world. I was amazed again when we started singing the songs that we sang that I was like, God just orchestrated it again. The voice of truth is the Holy Spirit who is speaking in us and to us and through us. And so Jesus showed them during that 40 days how he had come to establish the kingdom here on earth, the kingdom of heaven here on earth. He came to seek and save the lost, and now it's your turn to do that. It's our turn now to do that. But he was also showing them there's no way, he showed his disciples, there's no way you can do this on your own. And that's why I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to help you with that mission. And today, we, we have a sense that we also, we need the Holy Spirit to help us in that work. To give us power and wisdom and everything else that we need to proclaim the good news to this world. That's hard to do. And we need his help to help us show the world the forgiveness of Jesus and the hope of Jesus. So it says, while they were all together and Jesus was with them, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
So it's interesting that even though Jesus had been in the flesh with his disciples for three years, walking with them, teaching, healing, doing all of these things that he was doing, showing them what the kingdom of God was really like, the disciples were still stuck in thinking that the kingdom of God was going to be this political and economic power that would be returned to Israel again. And that's why Jesus still needed to spend another 40 days reteaching the disciples about what the kingdom of God is. A kingdom is where a king rules or reigns, right? And so the kingdom of God is where God rules or reigns. But it's not a political kingdom. It's an unseen kingdom where God reigns in the hearts of those who acknowledge him as king. So it's this strange thing where even though God reigns over everything, he rules over everything in the sense that he has power over everything, right? But there's also another sense in which he reigns in the hearts of those who do say, yes, you'll be my king. I want you to be my king. Now, Jesus here in this chapter goes on to acknowledge there is going to come a time where he will return in power and in might to put a final end to those who do evil. But he says, that's not for us to know when that time will come about. Now, I'm sure that in your lives, you have seen many teachers through the years who are all about trying to, you know, predict when the time is going to be. And Jesus is like, no, nope, you don't need to know about that. All you need to know about is that I will come back one day, and that's enough for you to know that. That that is what you need to know to have strength to do what you need to do. So, the important thing, he said, is that you will be my witnesses. Starting right here in Jerusalem, and then going out to Judea and Samaria, and ultimately to the ends of the earth. And that was why the twelve, who were primarily called disciples, are now called apostles. Because an apostle is someone who is sent out to proclaim something to somebody else. So that's why they're now the 12 apostles. <clears throat> now, that is what we, though, are also called to as followers of Jesus. We're called to carry his message to whoever the Father crosses our paths with. And the apostle Paul put it this way. He said... If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Hopping down a little bit in that passage, he says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Now, Ozark Christian College, the college where I work at, that's our, our mascot, if you will, the Ozark Ambassadors. And it may seem a little bit strange, you know, you know, we're not the Tigers or the even the Knights or anything like that. We're the ambassadors. <laughs> but an ambassador is someone who has to have courage and strength. Because, you know, if a U.S. ambassador goes to say, Russia. The U.S. ambassador to Russia has to have a lot of strength and courage and wisdom to do what they do, which is to try to carry goodwill to others, right? That's what an ambassador does in another country. They're trying to carry goodwill on behalf of somebody else, and that's what we are now. We're ambassadors for Christ trying to carry the forgiveness and the, the love of God to others. So, that's something we know we can't do on our own. 
We need the power of the Holy Spirit helping us to do that. So after Jesus said all of this stuff, he was taken up into heaven. Now that must have been both an amazing thing and a hard thing at the same time. It would have been amazing, you know, the disciples, you know, you watch Jesus like, and you just keep on going, going, going up into heaven. It says, so the cloud took him from their sight. That must have been a great confirmation. Wow, he really is who we believe he is. He's the son of God because only the son of God could do something like that. But at the same time, how sad must have that been for them, like that he was going away and they didn't get to have his bodily presence with them anymore. Or actually, was that the case? Maybe they started to realize, okay, we're going to have the Holy Spirit living inside of us now, and we have bodies, so we are now the body of Christ to the world. We get to be his hands and feet. So, he, he was taken up, and they were given this promise. Two men in white robes, presumably angels, said, Jesus will come back. In the same way, you saw him go into heaven. Jesus would come back one day, but in the meantime, there was work to do. Now, there was work to do, but the disciples obeyed Jesus. They didn't just go out and do it. They didn't immediately start taking his message to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. They obeyed what Jesus told them to do, which was to stay there in Jerusalem and wait on the promised Holy Spirit. Now, their waiting was both passive and active. So it was passive in the sense that they weren't going ahead of God and just doing, you know, carrying the message without waiting for the Holy Spirit. So they were waiting, and yet they were actively doing it because it says that they were praying. It says they all with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Now, I don't know if that seems like a big deal to you or not, but man, that was really a big deal. That before we can reach out well to others, we need to reach up. We need to reach up before we reach out because that's the only way we're going to be able to do that well. We have to realize our complete dependence on the Holy Spirit to change us and to give us strength and wisdom and to even cross our paths with people who are, are ready to hear the gospel and to give us whatever else we'll need to love people and to proclaim the gospel. So um, we're not at the end of the message yet, but I want to sing a song for us right now that, that talks about that very thing, that talks about how we need to reach up to God before we reach out to others. So hopefully this song will help us Think about that in a little bit different way. Yes, reach out to your neighbor. we 
to others, that the Holy Spirit has to help us be able to forgive ourselves before we can reach out with his forgiveness to others, that he has to help us see others with the kind of compassion that he sees them with, so many things. And so, they were praying. They were gathered together in the room. And as they were praying, they realized one of their particular challenges. Judas, one of the twelve, you remember, had betrayed Jesus, and the tragedy of Judas is that he could have been forgiven of that. But he despaired. And in his despair, he killed himself. This text doesn't include it, but Matthew 27 tells us that he hung himself. And besides the personal tragedy of Judas giving up on faith, there was also the issue of the apostles realizing they needed to fill his place with somebody else. And even though Jesus had several people who were following him, he intentionally had chosen 12 to be like the inner circle of those. And there was great symbolism behind that because of the 12 tribes of Israel. That, that that represented, Israel was known as the people of God, right? And so these 12 represented the people of God that were going to now proclaim his word not only to the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles. And so the people of God was now going to expand even farther. And to keep that symbolism of the twelve and to fulfill what was said in the scriptures and the Psalms, that one would need to take his place, the one who would betray the Messiah. So they put forward two men, Justice and Matthias, who had also been with them and with Jesus, it says, during all of Jesus' ministry. So these two had been with them the whole time as well, they, but they weren't named among the twelve. So those people would be able, either one of those guys could have been witness, witness to all that Jesus said and did since they'd been with him. So they had to choose which one of these men, though, would fill Judas' place. What did they do? Well, they relied on the Holy Spirit. By stopping and praying, it says they prayed this. You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry 
and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And then they did something which seems really strange to us. <laughs> they cast lots. Now, this was a common practice in that time to do that. And we don't know, in this particular case, if it was sticks of various lengths, like drawing straws, or if it was flat stones like coins that you would flip, or it was some kind of dice. But with one of those methods, they trusted, not in the method itself, but since they had asked the Holy Spirit to guide them, they were trusting that he would guide the sticks, or the dice, or the stone, or whatever it was they did to cast lots. And so when the lot fell to Matthias, they believed that the Holy Spirit had guided them. Now, does that mean that that method is always the best way to make decisions? <laughs> well, not necessarily. But the point was that they were putting their trust in the Holy Spirit to guide them. And they took a, a tangible step of faith in accordance with their prayer. You remember in the Old Testament when Gideon put out a fleece before the Lord and said, if this is really what you want me to do, you know, make the, the fleece be dry even though there's going to be dew on the ground all around it. And he took that to be, you know, believe that the Lord guided that and helped him. I've experienced something like this um, with the different albums, the uh, music albums that I've made. So on the first album that I was getting ready to make, um, I did what's called a Kickstarter, which is like a, a crowdfunding campaign to fund that. And I'd figured out like different levels of production of, um, I, well, I could do it this way or I could do it this way or this way. And I was also wrestling with God at the time of, is this really something you want me to spend time and energy and money on doing or not? Is this just a selfish thing that I want to do? And so the Kickstarter for me was kind of a fleece before the Lord because I had kind of in my mind what I thought probably the dollar amount that would be raised if I asked family and friends and that they would share. But like this amount was what it would take to do the level of production that I was hoping to do, which was like way beyond anything that I would have been able to raise. And so I said, okay, God, if you really want me to do this, I know there's no way I could raise this much money on my own. So if you really want me to do this, you provide for that somehow. And if not, I'll take that as a no. Because the way it works with Kickstarter is if you don't raise the full amount, you don't get anything, and so you don't do the project. So um, I put out the Kickstarter, and what I thought would get raised by a family and a lot of friends giving was what was raised, about $5,000. But the Kickstarter was for $10,000. So I was like, okay, God, it's going to have to be all you. You know, and there was like a week left to go. Well, with one day left to go, an anonymous donor, unlooked for, gave $5,000 to put it over the top. And I was like, wow, thank you, God. And so got to make that album. Since then, I've done two more albums, same thing. Took the same approach with it. And for each, all three of those, there was always somebody who gave a large gift at the end, and it was somebody different each time, and someone unlooked for each time. And so I do believe that the Spirit does work through us taking tangible steps of faith where we ask him to guide us. And it's not a formula, and I think we have to be careful, you know, with doing things like that, but um, it seems like that is what happened here with the, the believers doing that, and so Matthias was chosen. Now, after all of that happened, the question still was for them, and, and it is for us today too, in our quest to seek the lost and to share the good news of Jesus, are we actively and intently relying on the Holy Spirit through prayer? Because that's really the point of this whole story, 
in Acts chapter 1. So we're going to take some time today to finish out, to just pray together for the Holy Spirit to help us in that mission. Um, and then I'll close us with a song that's a prayer for us to be aware of his presence. So let's just close our eyes right now, and I'm going to give us some specific things to pray about silently. So first off, let's just pray that the Spirit would work in us to help us be attentive to the people that he crosses our paths with. Maybe it's family and friends, or maybe it's a waitress at a, we at a restaurant that we go to. Maybe it is the mechanic at the shop that we go to. That whoever it is that God crosses our paths with, that we would be open and attentive to what God is doing through that divine appointment and that we would be open to uh, being his instrument through that. Let's also pray that he would prepare the hearts of the people that we do come into contact with, that he would prepare their hearts to be ready for Jesus to receive his love. Let's pray that he would give us words to share the good news, that, that we would share his love in action, but also that we would share the good news, that it's, that it's Jesus who's given us the love and the hope. tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my chains are undone your presence Lord Holy and fill the atmosphere your 
glory. God is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. So, Father, we ask that you would help us to be attentive to your Holy Spirit within us that you would give us open eyes and open ears to open ears to to listen well and to see well the people that we are with and that you would give us the power and the strength and the grace and everything that we need to take the message of your forgiveness and of the hope that you've given us to others. And we do trust that you will, just like you gave power and strength and wisdom to the disciples a long time ago, that you will do that for us and in us and through us too. In Jesus' name, amen.